Hello everyone, thank you very much for watching today. Welcome once again to my lesson. Today's lesson is on adaptations and habitats. Um, so this is week five, lesson five. Um, after this week, there is only one more lesson that I'm going to be doing. Um, so I hope you enjoy this one and find it very entertaining. So in the wild, every animal that lives in a particular habitat has adaptations that help it to survive in that habitat. So first of all, what is an adaptation? An adaptation is um, a change in the animal's appearance or a change in the animal's behaviour that allows it to survive better in its habitat. And the second question, what is a habitat? A habitat is, of course, an animal's home. Adaptations, like I just said, can be either physical or behavioural. So let's have a look at these examples of some physical adaptations of animals. Every animal has physical and behavioural adaptations that help it survive in its habitat. Here we can see a screech owl camouflaging perfectly to the tree bark in its habitat. Owls also have incredible vision for seeing in the dark for hunting and also incredible hearing for hearing their prey in the dark as well. Here we can see the honey badger. The honey badger has incredibly thick fur to stop bees from stinging it. This is handy because bees are one of its favourite foods. The honey badger also has incredibly sharp claws and long claws for foraging. And another physical adaptation is that just like a skunk, it has scent glands underneath its tail. And when threatened, it can spray a horrendous smelling liquid. Now let's take a look at a couple of behavioural adaptations. Lots of animals have behavioural adaptations. Here we can see a barn owl. Barn owls have adapted the ability to fly without making a single noise so that its prey doesn't hear it and run away. We can also see the meerkats. They behave in lots of different ways for safety. The first way is that they team up and stay together in big groups. They also, when they're running, stick their tails up in the air. This enables their friends and family to always see where they are. And finally, Meerkats can be extremely aggressive. And now let me just show you a few examples of animals and the wonderful adaptations that they have to survive some very, very harsh climates. Here we can see a musk ox. Musk ox are native to the Arctic. You can see that they have incredibly thick fur which can keep them warm in temperatures as low as minus 40. You can also see that they have horns for fighting and for protecting themselves. We can also see here the thorny devil lizard. These are native to Australian deserts in the outback. You can see that their skin provides an excellent camouflage to the sand. It is also very spiky to deter predators from eating it. And not to mention very scaly to protect from sunburn. And finally, the orchid mantis. Orchid mantis purposely look like the middle of an orchid. This attracts pollinating insects towards it so that it can get an easy snack. So now that we've learnt about adaptations and what they are, let's have a look at some of my animals and the adaptations that they have. So first let's look at speckle. Speckle is a speckle-legged millipede, also known as an olive millipede. Now, some of you will have seen him before. Apologies, previously I um, thought he was a girl, but he is in fact a boy. Um, so, sorry about that, Speckle. So all millipedes have very similar adaptations. Um, the first adaptation is their body shape. So over millions of years, they have evolved to have this really um, slim um, shape with all these legs that can scuttle through the forest, through the leaves on the floor, and um, they're very, very difficult to be seen by predators. So another adaptation that millipedes have, which they all have in common, is the ability, so this is a behavioural adaptation rather than the um, shape of the body, which is physical. So um, the millipede will coil itself into, well, a tight coil, 
And what this does is it protects the millipede because they have a very hard exoskeleton. Um, so this just keeps the millipede that little bit safer. And this is their defense, if you like. So that is one of their behavioral adaptations. So another physical adaptation that they have is that um, some millipedes can produce a very, very strong liquid or ink from their back end when they're scared. And what this does is it, um, well, it smells very strongly, so it puts the predator off from eating it. Um, it also can make the predator slightly itchy. Um, now, Speckle probably won't do it because he's handled regularly, so um, I don't think he really sees me as a threat, I hope. <laughs> um, but if he was to ink on my hand right now, it would be very bright yellow and it would actually stain my hand probably for about 24 hours. But other than that, it's not harmful or irritating in any way. So another adaptation that I'm going to show you, another physical one, is that they have this amazing ability to grip. So it's quite difficult for me to get him off my hand because the legs sort of curl around and grip on. So this just makes these, this type of millipede in particular, um, very, very good climbers. So here he is climbing around. And um, if I turn the wood upside down, you see he has absolutely no problems gripping on because of his very good grip. So next we have Berry, the Mozambique fire millipede. Um, so for the most part, the adaptations are very similar, the body shape, the grip, um, the ability to ink. Um, although I've never actually seen this one ink, fully enough. So she's obviously pretty chilled as well. Now the difference with, obviously, this millipede is that it is much smaller and, of course, it is bright red. Now, after trying to find information on why, um, they are bright red. There are a number of reasons why this could be. Um, the first one is that obviously bright red, it stands out. Um, it's like a warning colour, so it can put predators off eating it. Um, but also it's said that um, some reptiles and other invertebrates can't actually see the colour red. So this means that in theory, this millipede can actually be invisible to some animals. Right, so next we have a very fast um, critter. This is Tweedledee. Whoa, Domino cockroach. <laughs> very fast. So that's one of their first physical adaptations, is that they are incredibly quick. They can escape predators very easily. Now, um, whilst I know that the millipede had a long, thin, sort of round body, um, Cockroaches are doing a similar thing by having a very flat, thin body, like this. Sorry, I'm trying to get a good, a good view for you. Um, so this enables them to just hide under the leaves, under the rocks and logs and things like that. And they can, of course, make very quick escapes. Um, so this, I suppose, is both a physical and a behavioural um, adaptation there. So these are from India. Um, and probably their most... Um, well, clever adaptation in my opinion, is that they're trying to look like um, a specific type of beetle. I'm so sorry, I can't remember the name of it. But there is um, a beetle in India that's highly toxic that has black and white spots like these do. So these are trying to mimic that animal. And of course, the pattern is like a warning. So it puts predators off and stops them getting eaten. Just waiting for this one to come out of its shell. Right, so next we have got the um, albino giant land snail. This is Snow White. She's not fully grown yet. She's um, pretty big, but she's not full size. She'll probably grow to about the size of a coconut. Something like that. Um, so snails have a couple of adaptations that help them to survive. The first one, fairly obvious, is the shell. 
So the shell, um, first of all, it camouflages the snails. So when they're on the floor in the rainforest in Africa, where they live, you'll see they have um, these sort of brown and black and grey patterns that sort of make them look like a leaf or a bit of wood perhaps on the floor. And um, the most important adaptation of the, uh, sorry, purpose of the shell is that it is um, very handy for protection. So when the snail feels threatened, it can very, very quickly retreat back into its shell um, and not be seen by any enemies. So another thing that snails can do, another adaptation, which is both physical and behavioural, is that when they feel threatened, they will uh, produce lots and lots of mucus and it creates um, sort of loads of bubbles around the, the snail's body. And this is um, a bit of a shock for predators. It kind of puts them off from eating it. She's actually just done it to me now. See all that mucus there? Thanks for that, Snow. Right, so here is the lovely licorice. Some of you will have definitely seen her before, I think. So she's an Asian forest scorpion. So like all the animals we've seen so far of mine, um, their habitat has been the rainforest. So they've all got individual adaptations to help them survive in rainforests. So scorpions have loads of really amazing adaptations. The first one is the most obvious, is the sting. I'm going to try and get a um, view of the tail without frightening her. There it is. So if um, licorice was to sting me, heaven forbid, um, it wouldn't kill me, um, but it would sting rather a lot, rather like a wasp or a bee sting, I expect. Um, but there are some scorpions in the world that are, of course, deadly. Um, so her venom is only strong enough to sting um, a little insect-shaped insect snack. And I'm well aware that she's um, looking a bit podgy. Um, I think she's coming up to a malt pretty soon, so she's not eaten for about a week now. Um, so another adaptation that the scorpion has are the claws. So the claws are for catching prey. They're also for fighting, and you won't be able to see, I don't think, but the scorpion is covered in lots and lots of tiny, tiny hairs, and what these do is they pick up vibrations in the air. So um, the vibrations can indicate a snack, or it can indicate a predator coming towards her, so that means she can make a hasty retreat if she has to, or she can get ready for some food that's walking across. So my favourite adaptation of the scorpion is that they glow under UV light, like this. Now it's not fully understood why they do this. Oops, my light's a bit dodgy, sorry. Um, come on light. So um, some scientists believe that this is to confuse the prey. Um, because um, insects can see UV light differently to how we can. Um, but other than that, it's not really fully understood why scorpions do this. But um, I think you'll agree, it's a pretty amazing adaptation. And finally, an adaptation in behaviour that the scorpion has is that they tend to stay very, very still. Because you can see... Her enclosure is um, rainforest setup, and if she was in the wild, it would probably be very difficult to see her amongst all the soil and the moss and the leaves. Okay, so next we have Fishcake and Norman, um, a couple of my Brevis hermit crabs. So, um, one of the first adaptations of the hermit crab is that they... Um, as they grow, they swap and change their shells. So on the beach where they might find um, sea snail shells or any kind of shells really that they can fit into, they will swap and change. Um, the reason I've got them on a towel is because they do have rather sharp claws <laughs> and um, they are surprisingly uh, powerful. So um, if you do book a party with me, you will get to hold these, but you might just have to put them on your knee on a, a blanket and stroke them because uh, I wouldn't want you to get pinched. <laughs> so the shell, of course, is very important for keeping the crab protected. Um, 
And another thing that they have are these tremendous claws, you can see. Now, um, most crabs have uh, what's known as a major claw and a minor claw. So the major claw is the larger one, and the minor is, of course, the smaller. Um, so the reason they have this is that um, it actually helps them to balance because of the way the um, shell is uh, proportioned so the weight of the shell is on the right hand side so the balance for the larger claw is on the left um, which is pretty clever I think and what they do as well is they tend to hold their food still with um, the major claw and pull it apart with the minor claw you can see quite clearly the different sizes there if my camera will focus. And crabs do of course have very powerful claws. So not only are they for balance and for eating, but they're also for defense as well. If they feel threatened, they can give a rather nasty pinch. Take it from me, it hurts. And hermit crabs all have their own little personalities. Um, you can see Fishcake is quite brave, she wants to come out and explore, whereas Norman's very shy. He wants to sort of, whoops, keep himself to himself. Hang on, I've got a runaway crab. And another adaptation of a hermit crab is that they have an amazing sense of smell. Um, they can smell rotting food, rotting carcasses, which is one of their favourite things, for miles and miles away. Um, and they are scavengers, so this is very handy when they are trying to find food. So the hermit crab's habitat is um, the Caribbean, um, in the beaches and um, on the land as well, um, in nearby forests and things like that. So they're perfectly adapted um, to live in those areas because of their protection, um, their claws, and also their amazing sense of smell for finding food. Okay, so our next critter is another one from a rainforest habitat. Um, so this is maple, the giant Malaysian leaf insect, the Malaysian rainforest, of course. And of course, the first physical adaptation that we can see is the appearance of the leaf insect. Looks just like a leaf. Um, perfect adaptation for camouflage. You can even see as well that they have sort of brown edges that look almost like a dead leaf. So this just makes her appearance even more realistic. Now they do have a few um, behavioural adaptations that help them to survive. I don't know whether she'll do it, but they do this thing where they sort of flick their body oh, to look like a leaf moving in the wind. She's not doing it now, obviously. She did it when I got her out of her enclosure. But what they do is they sort of wiggle and sort of flick their tails so they look just like a, a leaf moving in the, the wind. And leaf insects, just like stick insects, are very, very good climbers. So they have adapted these tiny, tiny little hooks on their feet, which enable them to, whoops, climb the trees to camouflage and to stay out of the way of predators. So next we have Peppercorn, the tiny baby pumpkin patch tarantula, way too small to handle at the moment, um, but tarantulas have some pretty cool adaptations all the same. So the pumpkin patch tarantula's coloration um, acts very much like a warning to predators because it's, you probably can't see it too well in this light, but it's um, sort of luminous yellow and orange on a black background, so it's very striking. And all tarantulas have the amazing ability to kick hairs off their abdomen. So when they feel threatened, they'll use their hind legs and they'll flick hairs from the um, abdomen, which is the large section at the back with the pattern on it. And what this does is it releases um, lots of tiny barbed hairs into the air which can get into the predator's skin and the predator's eyes 
and this can be very irritating for the predator and it causes um, a very uncomfortable sort of itchy sensation my camera won't focus right so now we have ernie the male jungle nymph again not fully grown i do apologize but um, these are a very slow growing um, type of stick insect so again these are from a rainforest habitat very well camouflaged to look like a branch or a twig that's their first physical adaptation of course um, another physical adaptation that they have is that they're covered in sort of thorns can you see um, these make him look um, more scary basically um, and the thorny legs that you can see there I hope um, when they feel scared or if there's a predator they'll sort of snap their legs together really quickly and this makes a very uncomfortable um, prickly sensation um, and it makes the predators retreat so behavioural adaptations then. So um, like I said, if they feel scared, they'll snap their legs together. So that's a good behavioural adaptation to keep them safe. But what they can also do is they can um, play dead. Um, and they're very, very convincing when they do it. Um, they don't move at all. They look just like a little twig on the ground. So that's a really, really good way of um, keeping safe as well. You can see he's... Um, a good feel around with his antennas as well also to make quick escapes from predators um, what they do is they um, can just drop out of a tree all of a sudden so they can be climbing around and if they feel threatened they can literally just let go fall onto the floor and this is a really good way of um, making a quick escape so stick insects um, when they lay their eggs um, the eggs are very cleverly camouflaged to look like seeds. So I'm just going to show you a few of the eggs that I have in incubation right now. Right, so here we have just a few eggs in incubation at the moment. So here we've got some um, leaf insect eggs. And I think you'll agree they're very, very hard to tell apart from the soil. So I'm just going to pick one up so you can see uh, which bits I'm talking about. I have to be very careful with them. They are extremely delicate. Just there, so these little sort of pods with the little um, fringes on them. They are the leaf insect eggs. Um, so what they do is the leaf insect will drop them to the floor and the eggs are camouflaged to look like seeds. So um, there's less chance of them getting eaten. And the same applies for these ones here. These are Eurocantha calcarata eggs. Big word, I know. And these are the eggs there. So these look like little seeds or seed pods. Um, so the perfect camouflage. Eurocanthus stick insects actually bury their eggs in the soil as well using their ovipositor. So the eggs are even safer. Okay, so um, nearly at the end of the lesson, I just want to show you this quickly before the lesson finishes. So um, stick insects and other invertebrates, um, tarantulas do this, scorpions do this, uh, crabs do this. What they do is they actually molt their exoskeletons in order to grow, leaving these perfect um, insect shells behind. Oops, they're quite fragile, they're a bit like gold leaf. So there's one as well, so they leave these perfect little shells behind. Let me see what else I can find in here. Um, oh, there's a scorpion one there. This is really delicate. Oh, heck. So this is one of Licorice's old malts, you can see there. Um, so the malt comes off in one piece and um, a new bigger insect emerges from it. So here we've got a couple of tarantula malts. Um, this one's obviously a, a much smaller one. So just like the insects, they um, get rid of their old exoskeleton and emerge with a new soft shiny one. And you can even see on the tarantula, I hope you can see, the fangs. 
um, they actually molt the fangs off as well. I don't know if you can see. Um, this camera's not terribly good. I'll, I'll take a photo anyway and upload it, but you can see that they molt their entire exoskeleton, which is uh, pretty incredible, I think. And finally here I have um, preserved one of Vinnie the Rainbow Crab's molted exoskeletons in this resin here. So you can see really clearly major and minor claw, just like the hermit crabs had. And rest assured, this is just a malt. It's not, no live crabs went into this or anything. It was just the, uh, the byproduct of the exoskeleton. So you can see really clearly all the little parts of the crab there. Okay, everybody, so that is the end of our lesson on habitats and adaptations. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned lots from it. Um, so next week is going to be the final homeschooling lesson um, that I'm going to be doing until further notice um, because all of the children are now pretty much back at school. Um, I just wanted to do um, this series of homeschooling lessons just to give you an idea of what it is I do at schools and um, the kind of animals that you'll get to see if you book a party and the kind of information you can um, learn from it. So I hope um, it's given you all an insight into what I do. Um, so like I said, next week will be the final lesson. Uh, next week's lesson is on um, Masters of Camouflage and Stick Insects and that's going to be our last one. So um, thank you all for watching. I hope to see you all next week and take care of yourselves. <laughs>